You're listening to episode 11 presented by Dingle Days. I'm your host, Drea Dingle, and I believe that anything can be learned. If you believe that's true as well, then keep listening because it's the number one show to dive into serial learning and bring you the best tips, strategies, and technologies for pet parents. Today on the show, I'm joined by Sarah Bruski. Sarah is a dog sports coach who specializes in developing unique training plans and problem solving for teams that play in all dog sports. Clear communication and utilizing motivational training is her priority, as well as ensuring that both the dog and the handler are having fun. Sarah and her 12 dogs compete and train in a variety of sports, including disc dog, agility, obedience, protection sports, nose work, and dock diving. And today we're talking about canine athletes and how to get started in dog sports. Enjoy the show. Sarah, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? I'm good. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Just so folks, you know, in our audience who may not know you, can you tell us a little bit about your backstory and maybe just a little bit about how you got started in dog training? Yeah, absolutely. So I started training dogs when I was just 11 years old. I convinced my parents to let me buy my own border collie because I wanted to do all the cool dog sports I saw on TV during like the Prina Incredible Dog Challenge. So I wanted to do Frisbee. I wanted to do agility. I wanted to do all those really cool things. And, you know, I knew a border collie was the dog to do that. And so I saved up all my money. I saw an ad in the newspaper and I purchased my first border collie. And so long story short, an 11 year old should not be given a border collie unsupervised with no knowledge on how to train or like regulate how much they're doing with that dog. I did end up jumping him a lot when he was just a puppy and he ended up having some shoulder injuries. And so that ended our agility career right off the bat. But what it did do was it allowed me to kind of take a step back in training and really focus on teaching things like tricks. I picked up clicker training then, and I did all sorts of really cool things with my dog that I didn't know was possible. I mean, I was 11 years old. He was really that dog that taught me everything and let me just kind of experiment and kind of fall in love with dog training as a whole. He was my first dog. And then when my boyfriend, my husband now moved out, we got a couple of Great Danes as well as a Border Collie mix named Zuma. And yeah, yeah, I went from small Border Collies all the way up to Great Danes. And I did try to do agility with them and taught them all sorts of really cool things. And they are really what kind of pushed me into dog training as a career because they weren't easy dogs. One of them was really reactive active. And I really struggled with him. And even though he loved to do sports, he just couldn't be, he wasn't very safe around in public. And so that kind of pushed me into the whole behavior modification part of it. I learned that that's not really my thing. There are really great trainers out there that do a really good job with it. My passion though is sport dog training. And so my border collie mix that I rescued Zuma, she became my agility dog, my frisbee dog and and my trick dog and all that stuff. And she made me fall in love with not just agility again, but with frisbee. And so with her, I ended up finding the Australian Cooley breed, which is a really old breed out in Australia. It's a herding breed, very similar to like border collies and Kelpies and cattle dogs, but they're their own separate breed. And so I fell in love with that breed. I purchased um, Zynga, who is in my lovely painting I did back there. Um, so I purchased her, imported her from Australia, and then she took me really to the next level in this dog. We started competing around the country, and then I got hired by Perina. And so Perina hired me to come down to Perina Farms here in Missouri. So I moved from Minnesota to Missouri, and we do shows for the public almost every single day. And so that was my job for the past six years was performing for Perina with my whole team of dogs. So in order to do that job, you need to have a lot of dogs that are all really high energy working dogs because they're working every single day doing frisbee and duck diving and agility and tricks and meeting the public and just being general ambassadors for going out there and doing fun things with your dog. And so now I have 12 dogs. I no longer work full time for Perina, but I do work part time for them on a subcontractor basis. So, you know, you'll see me there here and there throughout the summer now that they're starting to open up again. But what I mainly do now is I'm a dog sport coach for online. So I teach through the Fenzie Dog Sport Academy. I teach a whole bunch of different classes through them, different webinars and workshops as well. And then I travel around and I teach seminars all over the world as well on dog sports. So a whole bunch of various dog sports. I compete in dog diving. I compete in scent work, obedience, rally, agility, protection sports like Madi Ring and IGP. Pretty much if there's a sport, I've done it. And I really, really like all of the dog sports. So my goal now is just to kind of convince people to go out there and do more with their dogs. And that's one of the biggest passions in my life. That's so great. And I love just hearing the passion in your voice. I can just tell that you absolutely love it. Starting at the tender age of 11, learning and growing with your experiences throughout that actually helped you leave with you and your furry dog friend family that you have now. 12 dogs now, is it? Yep. 12 dogs. 
I know. Wow, we're gonna get into that because I'm sure there's some things that are quite unique about growing a dog family so large. But I hear the love and passion in your voice and that's really excellent. I mean, we have a lot of folks that tune in that are familiar with dog sports, but maybe in some general terms, you know, because you mentioned the few right there and we're gonna touch on a little bit of what makes each of those unique. Um, not necessarily textbook, but just like a general overview of somebody were considering, hmm, what might be the right fit for my dog or what are some things that I can consider and things that are out there? Because I didn't even know initially years ago that there were so many dog sports. I think most people have seen agility on television at some point. You know, scent work has gained a lot of popularity. If you have certain breeds, you might be more into the, the, the shoots and, and the IGP, you know, the tracking and such like that. So let's touch a little bit on that. What are dog sports? And maybe highlighting some of those that we just mentioned, the ones that you participate in with your dogs. Yeah. So like you mentioned, agility is definitely the most popular dog sport in the world. And, um, there's a ton of different dogs that can do it. You can, I, I competed with a little Papillon. He was only seven pounds and he really rocked it all the way up to my great things. Like I said, did agility. So as long as they have the proper foundation, they're athletic, you know, they are fit enough to do the sport per your vet. As long as you're using positive reinforcement, they are going to be able to do agility. However, there are some dogs that, you know, running and jumping and climbing is not their forte. They would much rather you know, maybe relax on the couch and that's okay because there's different sports like scent work like you mentioned which are really catered to the maybe more lower energy dogs the ones that um, they really like to sniff out things they're in the backyard exploring looking for the chipmunks that sort of thing those sports are really made for those type of dogs and then there's things that are even just like trick dogs so trick dog itself is becoming a whole sport with different championships and titles that you can earn as well and that one, you can just do most of those titles in your own living room. So those dogs that really struggle in new environments, or they might be fearful of people or other dogs, they can actually be doing a sport in your own house, which is really, really cool. And that's a really exciting thing. Um, other than that, I mean, there really is a dog sport for every dog and every person out there. Uh, lure coursing is a really great one to get started in. So the fast cats that are out there now, that's the, the um, event name where if your dog likes to chase things, so they're out there maybe looking for squirrels and bunnies, lure coursing might be something that they might really excel at. You basically put your dog on the line, the lure goes, and then they run out and chase it. So a lot of dogs really like that. There's minimal training. So you can kind of get your feet wet in that sport kind of community and environment and get a feel for what it's all about without having to put in a lot of background work to get there. And then of course there's obedience. So that's your traditional going in there, heel, sit, stay, and all of that kind of more traditional obedience stuff. But there's that little step sibling of obedience called rally. And rally is more like that entry level into obedience. It's about going in there, you can talk to your dog, and praise your dog and you follow this different course with different obedience behaviors that you have to do. It's different every time it's timed, which is kind of a cool little aspect to bring into it. And that tends to draw in more of the, the people coming into obedience. You, you go out there and you title, title your dogs in rally to begin with, and then you might go into obedience from there as well. Then if you have dogs that are bred specifically for things. So if you have like a border collie that has great herding instinct, obviously herding would be a great thing to try with that dog. Or if you are really into something like the protection sports and you have a dog that is bred for that and they have the instincts for that and the genetic disposition for it, you know, in protection sports like IGP, um, Mondio Ring, French Ring, there's a sport for those type of dogs that are a lot of commitment, but they're a ton of fun as well. So like really there's a dog sport for every dog and every person. And it's just a matter of finding that sport, finding the support group that's going to help you excel in that sport and kind of getting your feet wet and going to that. The other one I want to mention that people don't tend to really think about a whole lot because it's not framed in that whole traditional dog sport mentality, like you would see at like an AKC show or something along those lines, is disc dog. So disc dog, uh, you don't have to be doing those crazy backflips and the huge vaults off your body or anything like that to be good at it. There's different organizations out there like Up Dog that really help the beginners learn the fundamentals of disc with minimal training. So if your dog likes to play frisbee or even they like to play ball, you can bring them to an Up Dog event and get your feet wet in there. And like you don't even have to have much training. You can even have them on a long line. So they don't even have to be off leash and kind of learn what this dog is all about through like up dog challenge is a really good resource for that as well. Well, that was a really great overview. And Disney uh, from early on, he had a knack for catching a Frisbee and based off availability and stuff, we definitely want to try to get him into that as well. I mean, there's just so many, oh man, they're just so many, they're just beautiful. And you've, you've got a few dogs to choose from to, uh, to get them into different things. We've been focusing lately, obviously on the scent work aspect, but I want a well-rounded dog and some of those are just really exciting. Now, one thing you kind of mentioned earlier is that you like travel around the world and the country 
Have you seen maybe that some of these dog sports are more popular in one region than another? I had a video on AKC scent work versus NACSW and it seemed like NACSW wasn't very location friendly for, I had some clients in the, in like the North Carolina, South Carolina region. And I don't know if it was just their particular town or anything, but have you seen something like that to whereas there might be more clubs or more opportunities in certain places for certain types of sports, maybe they're more regionally popular? Yeah, that's such a great question. Yeah, absolutely. So I've had the pleasure of I've went out to New Zealand a couple of times, as well as Australian teaching out there. They're really trying to get disc dog going more out in those regions. So Australia does have the CDA, the Canine Disc of Australia organization, but they just recently got like Up Dog, which has really expanded their disc or opportunities to compete in, as well as New Zealand didn't have any organizations. So they didn't have disc dog competitions at all until we brought Up Dog out there. And now they're able to host those competitions, and actually get their community going and, and growing, which is really, really exciting. And so that's one of the cool thing about the different organizations, because some of them are easier to bring in, get people going, get them excited about the sport, and then bring in the other organizations to help expand the interest from there. And so it's really great that there are so many different organizations, like you said, NACSW, AKC Center work for AKC is a little bit easier to get going and get started, but NACSW presents different challenges and it could be a little bit more exciting to get your titles in that. You know, every organization has a different give and take, a different pro and con to it. As far as availability, one of the sports that I compete in is called Mondial Ring. And so that's yeah. a protection sport that's based out in Belgium. And out in Europe, it's a completely different sport because of the availability. So you can travel to basically a trial almost every weekend out in Europe and get those opportunities to really trial your dog, get your dog's experience. Um, there's decoys, the people that get in the bite suits, like everywhere. You know, it's not hard to find a, a decoy that that's willing to work with you and, and help build your dog. And here in the United States, like it's just not, um, I was planning on last weekend traveling to Utah, which is a 20, 20 hour drive for me to trial. And so the uh, next trial will be our national, which is in Colorado. But after that, we have to drive up to like Minnesota to compete. And so, and these trials are, aren't very often. And so the, just the trialing opportunities are so slim. And that means that the amount of pressure that goes on me and my dog at each trial is significantly more because I can't just go, Oh, we'll get it next weekend. Or we'll get it the weekend after that, because these trials are so far and few in between, I might only compete two, three times a year versus a sport like agility. I could go out there and trial every single weekend of the year if I wanted to, because the availability is that great. And so that's always something to think about as far as the sport you're getting into. And that's kind of where I mentioned the making sure that there's a support group for you in that sport, especially if you're beginning. So finding a club and making sure that that club trains the way you want to train, there's not going to be any conflict there and that they're able to tell you when the trials are and help you and your dog get really prepared and understand the rules so that you have the best foundation you can going into that sport. And so the availability is a major deal. Absolutely. And some definitely to consider for sure when looking at a dog sport to get started in. That's a really good point. I wanted to make sure I hit on that because it, it does come up, you know, often, you know, with, with some folks and then we have a, we have a global audience actually. So that's really great to hear as far as the opportunities out there. And you mentioned that like a little bit of alignment is kind of like what you were hitting at. So can you touch just briefly, you mentioned positive reinforcement, maybe some tenants of what you, uh, I mean, not like super formal, but you know, what, what's your dog training philosophy? So I, I use positive reinforcement in my sport dog training, depending on my dog, I might mix in some non-reward markers in there, depending on what their personality is like, you know, what problems are facing that sort of thing. I really try to use a nice, clear communication system. So I have a multiple marker system that I use with my dogs. In the house, I do use verbal interruption. So if they're being naughty, I have very, very naughty dogs. I am not a good manners trainer at all. So if my dog is like standing on the counter, you know, I'm definitely saying, oh my goodness, no, you know, I'm going to tell them no in that situation and then try to prevent it in the future, which is the, the easiest with the dogs I have. So with my dog sport training, which is really what I focus on, it's much positive reinforcement as I possibly possibly can use, but you know, I do go into the other quadrants as you know, if I have to, for sure. No, totally. Totally. No, I, I agree. I'm, I mean, I'm all about positive reinforcement. I mean, I know there's different methods and everybody's got everything out there. I just wanted to put it out there in case anybody was wondering with regard to that. Can we talk a little bit about, and we kind of hinted at it, prerequisites, if you would. We talked about some of the different breeds that might be more suited for one or the other, but when we talk about barriers to entry with regard to equipment, would you say that some sports are easier than others? Like maybe, maybe we'll start with maybe like agility, for instance, if you want to start that, do you need a lot of stuff? 
So agility is a little bit tricky because if there is a school that, that teaches competition agility near you, you can get away with maybe just having a couple of jumps at home and going with that, or maybe even just some cones so that you can work on your handling in between classes, as long as you're taking those classes regularly. Now, if you don't have access to a competition agility class near you, then it gets a little tricky because you do need to teach those contacts, the A-frame, the teeter, the dog walk, and that's some big money to get the competition size of those equipment, which you you really do need to have and your dog has to be well versed on so that your dog is safe when they're doing that equipment at speed. And so it's a little tricky. Like I'm looking at my backyard and I have a full set of agility equipment out there because I don't have regular access to competition agility classes in my area that I can actually go to since I travel so much and, and that sort of thing. So I do most of my training at home, but back when I lived up in Minnesota and I was working at an agility facility and we were you know going to class every week, multiple times a week, sometimes depending on how many dogs I had, I I didn't have any equipment at home. Actually, I had maybe a couple of jumps, but I rarely used them because we just worked on that stuff in class. And so agility, depending on where you are, you know, the equipment availability could be a factor, or if you could just go to a school and take classes from a competition instructor, instructor, then you're fine. And you don't need to have much at home. As far as I think the easiest thing would probably be disc in my opinion. Like you just need a couple of Frisbees and you could even go get the check it zip lights from PetSmart or Petco and get started with those and be just fine as long as you have a nice grassy flat area. So that's one's pretty easy. And then of course, trick dog. I mean, trick dog, you just need some treats in your dog and you're kind of good to go um, as far as that goes. So those are probably be the easiest ones. Scent work is pretty easy too, depending on your method of introducing the scent and then teaching the scent discrimination aspect of it. Those are some great points, you know, because I mean, some folks are like, oh, what do I need to get started? And depending on where you are, like I said, some places there's lots of availability. Obviously the pandemic has changed some types of availability for in-person. I know we're kind of, depending on where you are, getting back to some in-person training and whatnot, but definitely always to put out some options like that. Like for instance, uh, Thock diving, right? Yeah, you, you need some resources there. I mean, if you don't have that in your home, you just don't have it, right? Well, and dock diving is so hard because a lot of people think it's, you know, as simple as it just throwing a toy off the dock and your dog pursues it and they jump and they catch it and like you're, it's magic, it's easy. But there's a lot more training to it than people kind of realize. And so I have a couple of puppies I'm starting and they'll be dock diving dogs in their future. And so even though I have access to a pool, you know, we're starting at a, a natural body of water to make sure that they really love swimming before I even bring them to the pool. So not only do you need access to that pool, but you need access to like natural bodies of water to make sure that your dog is staying fit and they're able to swim that distance and, and not get injured. And, you know, they're learning that confidence in that part of it as well. So there's a lot to that sport that a lot of people don't, um, you know, don't, don't even really realize. That was one, I, I'm always discovering them. I, I discovered that one a couple of years ago as well. I mean, I knew and heard about scent work just because it was so super popular. It's kind of trending right now, but dog diving, I thought that was just so interesting. I'm like, man, yeah. these dogs are just flying. Yeah, are um, cool. Our pool opened up yesterday. I was like, as soon as I heard it was open, I'm like, okay, well, I'm coming this evening because I need to go swim my dogs. And <laughs> all my dogs were so thrilled to jump off a dock again. It was amazing. Let's talk a little bit about that. So what does conditioning look like for some of the dogs? We talked a little bit about dock diving and some of the prerequisites, having access to, to open water or whatnot. But like for some of the, uh, what was it, IGP, for instance, a big time commitment, you know, periodic competitions here in the States. What does that look like as far as conditioning the dogs? training. So it, it, like I said, again, it depends on the sport. So, you know, you have scent work where in the lower levels, you don't need to have a lot of endurance on your dog, right? The searches aren't that long. They're only looking for a couple of hides, but once you get to like that level three or the elite levels, now your dog's doing longer searches and they're having to have a lot more endurance. Sniffing is hard work for them mentally and physically. And so making sure that your dog is acclimated to the temperature, the humidity, whatever it is, and they're used to working in that environment for whatever duration of the trial, plus some is going to help your dog set up for success. And if you're ever questioning on how to do that, there are dog sport um, people out there. Bobby Lines is a great one to contact as far as making sure that you're developing a program that is fit for you and your dog and your sport and your climate as well. And so making sure you're working with a professional to develop that program is a good way to go about it. Um, so even sports like scent work, they do need to have that physical conditioning and same with trick dog, right? So if my dog's doing even arm hoops, if that arm hoop is high, my dog's got to have those muscles to be able to jump off the ground without injuring themselves and then land and be able to do that trick repeatedly. So always think about the 
conditioning in terms of the sport itself for agility, obviously that's more of a sprinting sport. And so short bursts of energy are more important than the long duration and that endurance. So then you mentioned IGP and Mondia ring. Well, the Mondia ring is really tricky because you're on the field one time. So IGP shuts and you're working three separate times. So you have your tracking phase and you put your dog away and then you go to your obedience phase and you put your dog away and come on into the protection phase. And so everything's kind of broken down. You're not on the field for terrible lengths of time where Mondia ring you're doing everything all in one session. And so, um, sorry, my dog is rolling on the ground and sneezing right now. <laughs> um, so you're doing it all in one session. And so for a level one, which is the easiest level, you're on that field for at least 15 minutes and your dog is working that entire time. And so in level three, you're on that field between 30 and 45 minutes. And so you're not working for that amount of time. That's a lot of mental endurance. That's a lot of physical endurance. And so the dog I compete in and with Monty Ring, his name is Creature. He's a three-year-old Belgian Malinois. And he is not the best about breathing. Like he just, <laughs> he gets so excited. He puts 130% effort into everything he does and gets himself so worked up. And so managing his arousal level is one of my priorities, making sure he's as calm as he possibly can be. And then making sure that he is physically fit with his endurance endurance as possible as well. And so right now we're prepping for our national, which is in the middle of May. He is working on swimming to build up his muscles. He is going on hikes to build up his endurance for longer durations of time. We are working in higher humidity and heat to make sure that he is learning how to breathe. We're doing different breathing exercises, including holding things in his mouth while he's running the treadmill, because he's going to have to be able to hold that bite suit in his mouth while he's still breathing. So he's learning how to breathe through his nose for that. And he is also doing things like bike joring. So that's working all those pulling muscles as well. And then the more cross training I can do with him, the better. So we do a lot of scent work stuff too, so that he's learning to sniff, even though he's tired, which is a big aspect that he needs to make sure that he's capable of doing. And then the other thing we're doing is making sure that he can work in the elevation and the climate that we're going to be competing in. So like I've already said with Monty Ring, we have to travel. And so we're going to be doing the national in Colorado, 5,000 feet elevation. And so I'm out here in Missouri. And so we're not, we're not high up at all. And so elevation is a major concern for me. So we're going to head out there, you know, five days in advance, make sure he's acclimated to that elevation. And then um, hopefully he'll be, be able to breathe just fine and really make sure I'm setting him up for success the best I possibly can. So lots of conditioning. It's always important to cross train as much as you can. So doing different activities with your dog and then making sure that you're working with a professional to develop that conditioning plan for sure. And I don't know if we have a lot of athletes out there. I know I grew up as an athlete in different sports, but there's a lot of similarities, right? Like, I mean, you see you and hear about all these things. And if you're just tuning in on television, it'll be like, when did the football team get there? They've been there for like a week or, or two weeks in advance. You know, why to acclimate the folks, you know, if you're from this side and, you know, all of a sudden you got to play at an altitude, you're going to be sucking wind. Um, and why wouldn't you think it'd be any different, you know, for your dogs, right? And that's just one aspect of it. You know, all of those different elements like you talked about and working with your trainer to develop something. But I mean, it all makes sense. I'm like, yeah, I mean, if, if you're used to training in a cold place or that's normally that climate during most of the year and all of a sudden, you know, you're laid under the sun, well, that might affect the, your ability to perform if you don't, you know, build up to that and actually condition your dog for that for a great performance. Yeah. And one of the biggest ones that people, you know, might not think about is just coming out of winter time right? So it's springtime now. And so people are like, oh, it's beautiful outside. Let's go do something active with our dogs. And then they go play frisbee with their dog and their dog is toast after three or four throws. And it's because, you know, that heat, that humidity, that sun is so much more than they've been experienced all winter long. And so we really need to take that in consideration. Even if we've been doing those activities with our dogs over the winter time, now it's significantly harder. And so we just had our first 80 degree day today. And so I'm sitting out there with the dogs and they're, they're just, you know, already toast, just being outside in that heat. And so, um, yeah, I'm definitely going to have to build up their condition and, you know, having these dogs and having that job I had at Perina where, you know, I had to rely on them for my income and, you know, I had to te treat them like professional athletes because that's what they are, right? They're getting paid for their athleticism to perform sports. It really makes you kind of take a, a different approach and make sure that you're really helping your dog out. That, and that's a great experience and not everybody has that. So I really appreciate your insights and just like, hey, here's here's how it is, particularly for somebody who is doing it on such a regular basis, you know, and then traveling with your dogs too, which in and of itself is its own conditioning. I know some folks, you know, periodically travel with their dogs, but it sounds like you do that a lot more frequently and your dogs are used to that, you know, and in abroad as well. So not only in the car, but in flight. 
yeah, it's definitely an important aspect for sure. If I have to travel and do a, like a halftime show or something along those lines, you know, my guys have to be really, really okay traveling and it just has to be part of their daily life. And so that's why I try to make it to, to be for them. Absolutely. Because we're talking about all things dog training today, I just wanted to take a second and tell you about Dingle Days. If you listen to a few podcast episodes and you enjoy any of our social media content, then you'll love our YouTube channel. With the help of my German Shepherd dog, Disney, I walk you through the basics of canine scent work, pet photography, and the best pet technology to complement your productive lifestyle. So head over to YouTube, leave us a comment, and subscribe to our channel today. And I want to jump into a little bit what you do with regard to your offerings personally, but I want to touch on this because it's something very near and dear to a lot of folks' hearts. Can you tell us a little bit about, you know, what you do with rescue and, you know, your contributions there? Because that's so important. Yeah. So of course, you know, I always believe that, you know, every dog does have the potential to be amazing, whether that that dog's job is just to be a fantastic family pet, or maybe their handler wants to help them become a world champion in some sport. And so because of that, I do have a lot of rescue dogs. Uh, the number has kind of shifted a little bit. I do breed Australian coolies as well. And so that's kind of my main focus now is, is that. And so as my dogs kind of retire, they're getting replaced by coolies <laughs> instead to help my breeding program. Taboo is my 10 year old border collie Staffordshire bull terrier mix. She is a rescue from a neglect situation. And then kickstart is my seven year old border collie. And she was a rescue as well. And then of course I already mentioned Zuma. And then I have a little Boston Terrier Shih Tzu mix named Edgar that I adopted from the local shelter where he was surrendered because he had double cherry eye and they couldn't afford the surgery. And so that's, you know, obviously I have those dogs in my own personal home, but I also always try to foster. So my specialty is dogs that have the potential to do sports. That's my network. Those are the dogs I can place. And so while I think it's important that people do foster and help with rescue for dogs that have great potential as pets, that's just not my network. So if I do get a dog that is, you know, destined to be a great pet, but maybe not a sport dog, I generally try to work with the rescue to find them a home. But if they in turn, so if that rescue in turn has this dog that's just crazy high energy and they're crazy for the ball, then I'll take that dog as a foster and I'll teach it some foundation work. And then I'll go and find what sports it's going to be really good at. And then I'll go ahead and market that dog into that sport community and try to find them a home that's going to help bring out the best in that dog and give that dog a job to do because a lot of these dogs, you know, when they go to shelter, they have all this crazy energy and they don't know where to put it. And all that energy comes out as like bad things, you know, things that we don't like. And so that tends to be my specialty. If I have some extra time on my hands, I, I go to the shelter and I'll find, you know, the dog, the black lab mix that's bouncing at the door, scaring everybody away. I'm like, that's my dog right there. <laughs> and I'll go take that dog and place it maybe in a dock diving home or something along those lines. So right now I had a foster. It was a, a Oops litter. Um, it was a Malinois lab mix. So they had a litter of nine puppies. And I'm like, you know, that sounds like it could be a good, good sport dog right there, or a detection dog for a police department or something along those lines. And so we took one of those dogs, and then my friend's trying her out for search and rescue right now. And so she's out with my friend learning all about search and rescue and seeing if she'll be a good candidate for that job. So yeah. Well, and I love that. And I love that you niche down as well. You're contributing to such a great cause, but also using the gifts that you have and the experience that you have to bring out the best in some of these dogs. When you see that high level of drive or whatever you want to call it, I know some people don't like the word drive, but motivation or energy um, that, you know, hey, this dog could potentially be great in this and that. And then also sometimes potential pet parent don't even see that or that alignment or like, hey, this would be a great fit for, for this. And a lot of times, even when you're working with a breeder, I think some of the best are the ones who help match that dog with that particular family and based on their life lifestyle. And not only are the humans going to have a great time and relationship with their dog, but that dog's going to have a much better life. Right. Right. Yeah. I just had that conversation with somebody. They're trying to decide between two puppies. And, you know, one of the puppies was, it, it was more of a thoughtful puppy. And the other one was more like, haha, I'm just crazy. I'm going in this environment. I don't care. Right. So I was like this more wrecking ball puppy. And she's like, well, I'm not sure about this one puppy because it seems a little less confident and that sort of thing. I'm like, yeah, you know what? That puppy is confident just fine. If that puppy's placed with a handler who is patient and really loves building up dogs and, and really loves the journey of things, that puppy is going to be just fine. But if that puppy is placed with somebody like me, who is like, um, no, I just want to start training the fun things right away and like just have a blast of this puppy. And maybe I'm not so great about building that dog's confidence. Um, that puppy might not be as successful. And so it's not that there are dogs that aren't 
aren't going to be good. It's just that they have to be matched with that right person so that they can become a team and then excel at that thing together um, versus just relying on the dog to do all the work. Those are just some things to consider when you're thinking about, particularly a puppy, you know, when you're starting off on the journey, but even adult dogs need, need homes as well. Just think about that and the match is the alignment there. And like, even when you're considering a breeder, are they asking those things and communicating those things? Disney, he's not a rescue. He's, he's a purebred German Shepherd. But those are some of the things that we work with our breeder, like with alignment and some of the things I knew that I wanted to do with my dog down the road. So all great points. But let's talk a little bit about what you do with some of your course offerings and some of the possibilities that are out there with regard to remote dog training. Yeah, there's so many possibilities right now for online dog training. It's crazy. So we had a pretty good community before and a lot of opportunities before COVID hit. And then COVID kind of just snowballed us. Now you have so many great instructors online, tons of great availability. I was fortunate enough to have already been in that market. And so my client base was already there and that really, really helped make sure that the pandemic, I survived that okay. And, and so I was able to help branch out and help other trainers as well. And so for... Right now, Fenzy Dog Sport Academy has most of my courses on it. And so I teach a different course or two courses every session. And the sessions are every three months, I believe. I've taught there for several years. I am still not good at that part of it. Um, and it varies depending on the session for what I teach. So I've right now I'm teaching a disc dog class. And then next session, I think I'm doing a foundation, like a level two foundation class based on my level one foundation class and probably throwing some tricks or something like that in there as well. So I try to vary it a ton because you know, I do a ton of sports. I don't, you know, if I did the same thing every single day, I'd, I'd really struggle. And so having that variety helps me stay passionate about it. And it, it helps my students kind of explore and learn what they really like as well. And then um, consider the dog is another website that has some of my courses on there. On that one, I have an intro to disc class. It takes you through, you know, a lot of foundation things from choosing the right Frisbee to how to throw properly, which is 90% of that sport and some foundation work you can do with your dog. And then I have an intro to scent work class as well on there. And so that has a few different methods on how to teach scent work. And I just released that one, I think at the beginning of the year. So it's not that, that old on there. Other than that, I do have a Facebook group too. It is a paid Facebook group. It's um, just a one-time payment of $25 and you get into my Facebook group called the Zoom Dog Life. You can access that through www.zoomdogtraining.com. And that one's really cool. All I do is share what I'm doing with my dogs. And so there's everything on there right now from puppy socialization, kind of what I was doing with my puppies when they were really young, they're six months old now, teaching them a hold. So teaching them how to hold for like a competition obedience retrieve, uh, some toy play stuff on there. And now I'm starting to talk a little bit more about my prep work for creature and the national coming up. So who knows what you'll see on there, but there's a ton of stuff on there already for sure. And I'll link everything either the podcast or the YouTube description below. So if the audience wants to check those things out, please feel free to do so. It's such a great resource. And I just love your passion. I, I know I've said it a couple of times, but I can tell you really enjoy this. And I love that you found your pocket of influence, if you would, you know, what you really particularly enjoy. And then you can see, you could put a hundred percent of your backing behind that. And then you give yourself some variety in the free Freedom, not to just do one sport, but hey, like you said, you know, I, if I had to do one thing, you know, the whole time, and I know that's not for everybody, but I just love that you've cho chosen that path and then you're giving that back to the community with all these resources. So that's awesome. So you may have seen it, but we have a, what we call a rapid fire question session here. Yeah. So just the first thing that comes to mind, kind of how I preface this is, uh, I believe that anything can be learned when it comes to pushing out content to the people. I don't think you can educate, inspire, and motivate others without doing the same for yourself. So let's help push some knowledge to the people and let's just see what's on your mind. Okay. So name something you're trying to learn and something you would like to teach this year. It could be something the same or something different, a skill, habit, whatever, something you want to oh learn. My something you'd like to That's teach. not a quick question. That's a hard question. <laughs> what am I trying to learn this year? It, does this have to be in terms of my dogs? I, you know, I should be because that's all, that's my entire life. Let's be honest. Um, <laughs> so something in terms of what I'm trying to learn this year, I'm trying to learn a way to teach the object guard and the escort, which are the advanced Monty ring um, exercises to creature in a way that falls in line with my training philosophy. So that means taking a little bit from 
other people's methods and seeing how it can work for us, um, not utilizing correction collars like the e-collar, the pinch collar, um, because that's what falls in line with my, my training philosophy. And so that's turning into a bit of a struggle. And so um, it's something we're really focusing on. And I'm, I'm really hoping to get a good framework for that. And that's successful for us. And I'm hoping to teach other people. I mean, it's the same thing that I've always liked to teach people is to how to develop a more clear communication system with their dog so that they can reduce frustration and training with their dogs and just focus on the having fun part. Love that. Love that. All excellent points. Communication is so key in dog training and people wonder why they have issues. It's like, we got to work on this piece first and then we'll get to that part right there. Um, so you mentioned some earlier, but name a favorite pet parent online resource you would recommend YouTube or otherwise. To say Fancy Dog Sport Academy, obviously, um, there's just so is such a wealth of knowledge. There's so many different instructors on there, so many different classes. I mean, there's even a dog photography class. Like goodness, so everything you ever want to learn, like there's a class on there, or a webinar, or a workshop. Other than that, just you know, follow dog trainers and following them on social media. So Denise Fancy is a fantastic one. Sarah Strumming, Hannah Brannigan, Pat Stewart is a fantastic one. The Canine Paradigm podcast is one of my favorites. Um, I mean, there's so many people out there, and so my vision is just go out there and learn from everybody because everybody's got something that can fit into your training philosophy or your life philosophy. And you can take that little bit. So learn from everybody. Love that. And I'll link those in the description below. Any dog product you would recommend? Oh, I'm loving the Kato boards right now. Like 110%. They're my favorite, uh, platforms. And okay. So like, if you could see my trainer room right now, I'm not going to show you because it's a complete mess because my dog has brought every single bone and toy out that she possibly could, <laughs> but, um, it's a whole bunch of homemade platforms. So I did like the plastic shelving. I put yoga mats on them. Like I'm the cheapest person, most thrifty person sounds better. The most thrifty person when it comes to training tools, like I would much rather make it myself than pay out money for a brand branded object. Um, and so I have all of these platforms and yet I finally got the Kato boards. I love them. They are fantastic. And so I just bought two more. I can throw them in my van. I can bring them everywhere. They're nice and stable, um, super traction on them. They're low. I can stack them to make higher. Um, so the Kato boards, 110%. I love that. I love that. Check, Check those out guys. I'll, once again, yeah. I'll link everything we're talking about. One thing you love about having a large dog family. Oh, um, <laughs> the one thing I love about having a ton of dogs is you put it so nicely, the large dog family. I'm just like, it's, it's a ton of dogs. <laughs> too many dogs. Um, there's always a dog that is up for something. And so, um, or there's always a dog that doesn't know something. This is actually my, my favorite that doesn't know something that I can experiment a new way to teach a behavior. So for instance, if I'm like, Ooh, you know, I haven't had a hold this way. Maybe I should try that. I can grab one of my dogs who doesn't know that behavior yet and then teach it and see how it works. And so for me, as um, somebody who's teaching others, that opportunity is so invaluable. I can always experiment. I always have a dog that's willing to learn. I always have a dog that might be a fresh slate in that behavior. And so I can just grab somebody. We can have a great session. I go, yeah, this worked because this, you know, whatever happened, or this isn't going to work because of this. And I can get that firsthand knowledge in that moment. And so I would say that's my favorite reason. Um, um, as far as being a, a dog instructor and, and teaching other people. The other one is the cuddles. So like I sit on the couch and like 14 dogs, or I mean, 12 dogs, you know, and they just pile on top of me. Sometimes you can't breathe very well, but you know, you're never lonely. <laughs> uh, yes. I love that. I love that. No, so unique. So unique. I have one. I think, I think, I think one's a good fit for us, but you know, I see down the road, you know, when I have like just land and I just want to see all of my, my herding dogs just, just surround me. Um, so last one, what advice would you give your younger former self just starting out as a dog trainer? Oh, I don't. Oh, um, so I always think about this that everything in my journey happened for a reason and got me to where I am. And so like, I wouldn't say like be more patient or anything like that. I felt like everything happened when it should have. I was very fortunate with the opportunities I got. And, um, you know, I was, I never really shied away from those opportunities and, and, um, I was very grateful every, for every single one of them. I think the biggest thing I would tell myself, the thing that caused the most stress was don't worry about what other people say. It's really easy, especially with social media nowadays to get caught up in what other people are doing or what other people might think of you. And in the reality, like what ended up working for me was just staying positive, staying in my lane 
lane and making sure that I was happy and my dogs are happy and that we were successful in what we're doing and letting my training really speak for itself versus getting online and telling people, this is the way it's working. This is, you know, this is the way you should do it. That sort of thing. So really being open-minded and, and passionate about what I'm doing without trying to push that on other people or taking other people's pushing their opinions on me seriously. So really just believing in myself, making sure that, you know, I, I, I was happy. My dogs are happy and, and sticking with that versus caring what other people think. I love that. I love your confidence. I love your energy so much. I would, you know, Hey guys, in case you haven't recognized, I would totally recommend her, you know, so <laughs> check out the links in the description. I am feeling it so much, but even something I do on my YouTube channel, you know, you know, I, I kind of try to lead with, this is how I train my dog to, to do this. I'm not saying that it will or won't work for your particular dog, but this is how I train it. I'm not saying this is the way, the only way. These are some things that align with my dog training philosophy. And if you want to check us out on this journey, here's how we do it, you know, and, 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 and it worked for us, you know what I mean? Something like that. What I try to do with this podcast is bring on the different trainers and kind of bring it all together. And, you know, pending, like you mentioned, social media and whatnot, and we'll keep this positive, but you know, sometimes there's a little bit of a dissidence, I guess, in the dog training community. And there's a lot of debates on, on this or that or whatnot. But I feel like if the dog is being taken care of, you know, and, and, and you're having fun with your dog, I think that's good enough. If you want to sit and have a conversation about this method or that method, then, then great, you know, but like, let, let's be respectful of each other, you know, and like, you know what we're doing? Cause there's just, there's just so much, there's just so much in the dog training community. So I like that you're, you're coming at it from the positive approach. Yeah. And, and I, you know, one of my biggest things, um, in the last probably year or so has been bridging the gap as, as we've been calling it. And because I live more on the positive reinforcement side of the spectrum, but because of the sports I do, I, I do train, I do collaborate with a lot of more balanced trainers. And so, you know, there's so much I've learned from them. And I think other dog sport enthusiasts don't get that opportunity nearly as much as we do in the protection sport world, just because our, our worlds don't tend to merge very much other than in that sport. And so I, I, one of the biggest things I've realized is that most of us, the majority of us dog trainers that are having these conversations online or in person, we all live somewhere in the middle of that spectrum, right? So on one end, you have the really like the alpha people, whatever. And then on the other spectrum you have, they're really like, I don't ever tell my dog no. And, and that sort of thing. Right. And most of us live somewhere in the middle here and, and, and that's okay. And we have so much to learn from each other. And so instead of thinking of as two different camps, why don't we think of it as a spectrum? And as long as, like you said, the dog is happy, the handler is happy, which is super important and it's low stress and, and they're doing what they want to do. Like, what is it my business that somebody's training their dog in a different method? Like, that's great. That works awesome for them. They're happy. That's awesome. I'm happy with my method and that's fantastic. And we can learn from each other in so many different ways. I love that. I love that. I just want to thank you so much for coming on the podcast, sharing your knowledge of canine dog sports, honestly, just your experience in general, because I just think your journey, right? Your journey, starting so young and learning the lessons that you learned and then coming, being an ambassador and, you know, now sharing that, you know, really with the world is just so excellent. So I really appreciate all of your insights and you taking the time real quick. I know we mentioned it earlier, but where can we find you on social media and otherwise? Honestly, I'm, <laughs> I feel like I'm getting old because Instagram is really hard for me. TikTok is really hard for me. And so I stick on Facebook, like, <laughs> Um, so just my personal Facebook, Sarah Bruski, um, on Facebook and it's all public. So everything that I post, you can see, you can comment on everything just like as if we were friends. So don't be um, upset if I don't accept a friend request. I am, you know, maxed out, but you can absolutely follow me and see everything and interact with me just the same. So on Facebook is the best way every now and then, if you, you know, I get a crazy, you know, bug up my butt or something, <laughs> I might post on Instagram, but, um, it's not very consistent at all. Well, thanks so much, Sarah. I really appreciate it. It. Yeah, thank you so much for having me on the podcast. This was a great conversation. Awesome. You've just listened to an episode on the Dogs Are People 2 podcast presented by Dingle Days. If you like this episode, make sure to leave me a review on iTunes and share this episode with your friends on social media. Just don't forget to tag me at Dingle Days. If you want even more good stuff, make sure to go over to www.dingledaysphotography.com to find the show notes in our blog and head over to our Dingle Days community on YouTube so that you can connect with other followers of our training methods there. I can't wait to see you there. And thanks again for listening in. Until next time, continue to get after it and share your best life with your furry friend.